Good morning, everybody. It's uh, Wednesday, May the 12th, and welcome back to the Quarantine Devotionals. Hopefully everybody's doing well. Middle of the week and uh, the start of your week has, has been a good one. I know we had a good start of the week as I was able to head up to, uh, to Canada and see some family, and um, uh, that's always nice. But uh, yeah, here we are. And the weather is going to be beautiful. We've had a beautiful week so far. And guys, I have good news. I checked the weather this morning. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to, but we have another, I don't know, at least four or five days of beautiful weather here out here in Port Townsend in the rain shadow. Rain shadow is in full effect. Uh, it's not always that way in the winter, but it sure is that way in the summer. And it's going to be another great week and a glorious day. Well, some of you are already pretty quick on the ball this morning. Uh, Sherry, good morning. Sherry, uh, number one again, and Sandy uh, Reed, nice to see you this morning, Sandy. And I know that we're going to have a few others joining us as well. Uh, I don't know who joins us unless they comment, but I can see the numbers kind of go up. And uh, yeah, so we're at four now, and we'll see who else is going to join us. We'll just um, we'll just take a minute and uh, and wait for some of those folks to roll in. But uh, while we do that, you know what, why don't we open with a word of prayer and uh, what better way to start our devotions, actually it's the only way to start our devotions, um, than, uh, than go to God in a word of prayer. So let's, uh, let's do that now. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God, Father in heaven, we want, to, uh, we want to thank you for a beautiful morning. We thank you for the week that you've given to us so far. Um, Lord, we know that uh, that everybody listening this morning comes here with different burdens, uh, with different weeks going different ways. We know that some, uh, some in our church especially, have had very difficult news this week, Lord, and, uh, and are going through very hard and dark times. And there are others of us, Lord, who uh, everything's just going fine. Uh, it's, it's full steam ahead. Uh, we pray that whatever our situation may be, that as we spend time just hearing your word this morning, Lord, even though we're actually going to only look at one word, just one word from scripture would comfort us and center our lives around you. Lord, we just ask that you would uh, honor our time spent this morning in your word so that we might know you better and serve you better we pray this in jesus name amen amen all right well who else do we have here oh carolyn bouquet all the way from ontario canada and that's why i put that eastern time zone thing in into the time because i know that there are some from ontario who may be joining us and and the urbanis as well and a few others guys as you log in just say hi this morning so we can see who's here and, uh, and it's kind of encouraging just, just to see that. So this morning, as I said in my uh, starting post, we're going to look at just one word from Scripture. Just one word this morning. And it's not very often that I, when I open the Scriptures up or, or speak about what God's Word says, I just kind of really focus on one word. But this morning, this word is so jam-packed, I figured this is all that's necessary uh, for this morning. Otherwise, we'll just be getting in over our heads. So I want you to open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And that places us at the Lord's Prayer. Luke chapter 11. And uh, good morning, Barb Hyman. Nice to see you. And the McIntyres as well. Um, so yeah, open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 11. And we're going to actually read the entire Lord's Prayer, which, which isn't that long. But we'll read the entire thing. And as you turn to Luke chapter 11, what is my book recommendation for this morning? Well, you know what? I don't think I've ever mentioned this one. And the reason I don't is because it kind of, um, I would something I would normally recommend more to a bit of a niche market. And that is the uh, New Testament scholars out there. But, you know, this is one of the books, one of my favorite books that I've ever bought. And I've had this book gosh, probably for 20 years now. Uh, it was recommended to me by one of the finest New Testament scholars in the world when I asked them about uh, um, uh, a book to kind of understand the New Testament historical context better at the time of Jesus. Uh, that scholar was Gordon Fee, who if you look him up, uh, great guy. Uh, all of his materials are pretty good. But this book is called Jerusalem 
in the time of Jesus. And it's by a guy named Joachim Yeremias. Um, he was a Greek scholar. Uh, but this book, if you want to understand the context of the times that Jesus lived in, I don't think there's any better book uh, out there than this one right here. It's dated now. It was written back in the 60s, but believe it or not, it's still kind of the gold standard for, um, for knowing what life was like in the time of Jesus. And man, it's not a huge book, but it is I am maybe the most densely packed book on my shelf with, with just uh, the amount of information about basically every aspect of life in, um, in the time of Jesus. So if you really want to uh, smell, the, smell the air and, and get a sense of the sounds of the marketplaces and all that kind of stuff around the time of Jesus, this is a book that, uh, that will greatly benefit you. Marriage Practices. Um, I mean, you name it, it, it's it's probably in here, and it will really help you to understand your New Testament a lot better, what the teachers were like, the Sadducees, Pharisees, I mean, just everything. Um, so, uh, Jerusalem, in, ah, you can't really see it that well, Jerusalem in the Time of Jesus by Joachim Yeremias, and uh, it's still in print today because it has just been so helpful to so many uh, scholars. Um, yeah, so there you go. A lot of times I recommend kind of more uh, pop culture, uh, readable kind of books. And it's not that this book isn't readable, but uh, but this one's a little bit different today. All right. So Luke chapter 11. And like I said, we are reading the Lord's Prayer this morning. And uh, let's start at verse 1 and we'll just go to verse 4. It says this. He was praying, Jesus was praying, in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. He said to them, whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us. And do not bring us into temptation. And that's the Lord's Prayer. Now, you might hear that and say, whoa, that's a lot different from the Lord's Prayer that I knew. Well, two things going on here. Number one is that I, you know, this is just a more modern translation. And so the way that I memorized it when I was a kid, and we used to say this prayer in school at the start of every single school day when I was growing up. Uh, you know, I don't feel that old, but when I say that, I feel old. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it was, uh, our father in heaven, uh, hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, our daily bread. Um, how does that go again? Uh, give us this day, our daily bread, um, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors, uh, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I said that so many times when I was a kid that it was drilled into my head. Now, so part of the difference is just that I'm reading from a more modern translation, and it's a saying the same thing. But another thing is that uh, most of the modern translations are missing that end part. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Why is that? Well, as, uh, as, as New Testament research goes on, there's two types of New Testament research. There's liberal, and then there's uh, what I would call proper research. Uh, one of the things that we've discovered is that ending isn't actually in any of the early manuscripts. That's a later addition to the text. And so most of the newer translations don't have that ending because it's actually not found in any of the original texts. And so it was probably added in later on. Whatever the case, uh, I mean, it's fine if we pray that ending, but uh, but that might be just explaining why it's a little bit different. So this morning, we're, we're obviously not going to take in this whole prayer. We could do that, but man, there's so much jam-packed in here. And I looked at it and I said, what should we do this morning? And I got to the word Father and I thought, wow, you know, there's a lot packed into that right there. A lot packed into just the very first word of the prayer, Father. And so I want to talk about that this morning. Because this is something that's revolutionary. This prayer that, that Jesus gave his disciples as a model was very different from what John was teaching his disciples, what the Pharisees and Sadducees taught their disciples when they were teaching 
um, their people how to pray these flowery and fancy prayers. Jesus' prayer is very different. It's revolutionary. And one of the things that makes it revolutionary is that it starts with the word Father. See, at that time, um, they didn't have this privilege of knowing God as Father. And guys, that's one of the things that when we read the Lord's Prayer and Jesus tells us this is how you should pray, this really, really um, is a privilege to be able to come to God as Father. And so that's the first thing that we can learn from just this one word is that we need to realize the privilege of being able to address God as Father. You know, uh, in Jesus' day, and you know, again, this is something that <laughs> this book will be helpful to, uh, to, uh, to help you understand. Um, there wasn't this concept of God as Father, really, like we have it today. I mean, many knew of God, obviously, but they didn't know Him as Father. In, when you look through the Old Testament, there is... Uh, there is some kind of notion as God as Father, but it's it's God. He's kind of the Father of Israel, um, and the Jews never referred to God as Father in any kind of I know Him intimately or I know Him as my as a child would know His Father kind of sense. Uh, they may have known also that you know obviously God cared for His people in general, but there was no sense of intimate intimate knowing of God, not the kind that Jesus is talking about here. And so when Jesus spoke like this, that God was his father, nobody said that kind of thing. And when Jesus models this prayer, pray to God as your father, the teachers would have said this was very controversial. They wouldn't have liked this, the religious teachers and the, the pastors and priests of that day. Why? Well, part of the reason was that they would consider God just, he's too holy. He's too high. Um, to be referred to as father. He's kind of untouchable. You can't have this personal relationship with him. And so when Jesus says this, even though we've heard this prayer many, many times, we, we don't have a sense that this is really, really revolutionary to consider God as this intimate father. And you know, so, you know, just like everything else, when Jesus comes along, uh, he changes the game when it comes to prayer. We know that uh, that when Jesus says this term, God is my father, this is very unusual for not just the teachers, but the people. And, and, and it would have uh, really shifted their paradigm. But that's what Jesus does, doesn't he? He always shifts the paradigm. And what he does here, when he starts this prayer with Father for us, and he teaches us, is that he takes God from being way out here, and he brings God to us. So that it comes true, what was Jesus, one of the names that we would call Jesus, Emmanuel, right? Emmanuel means God with us, Imanu with us, El, God, God is with us. And so that's what this prayer models for us. It models that God is now with us and, and we can have a very close and, and personal relationship with him. And so this is what, the, at the very start, this very first word makes this prayer so revolutionary. And this was, in our day, this is, uh, in Jesus' day, that was very different from Judaism. It still is different from Judaism. Jews don't consider God close like this to this very day. They don't have that intimate personal relationship with him. But in our day, too, when we consider other religions, it's still the same. You think of Islam. Islam says that God can't have a personal relationship with you. He's too high. He's too holy. He's too transcendent. Uh, Jesus says no. The true God, not this Islamic God, the true God does have a personal relationship with his people. And there are other religions out there today that say, you know what, God's just too far out there. He Maybe he exists, but he's too far out there for us to be able to, to know intimately, especially like a father. And then there are other religions out there that say, well, no, God is intimate. He's in everything, panentheism and some other religions, especially here in Port Townsend, where so many would say, you know, God's in everything. He's in the trees and he's in the birds. But again, there's no intimate connection with that. You might have tree huggers out there hugging trees, but that's as intimate as it gets. That's not real intimacy. That's not the kind of intimacy that, that, that as Christians we know as father intimacy. 
And so, guys, when we when we see this first word of this prayer, calling God Father, that that's a privilege to be able to call God Father. And that's all packed up in just the very first word of this prayer. And so we open our prayers like we did this morning, Father. And and uh, and we pray with that kind of privilege. Now, as we pray, that entails uh uh, like we said, knowing that he is our intimate father. And, and, and that's what, something that we need to really kind of digest. And we need, need to really love and take advantage of. Like we said in that opening prayer, uh, some of you listening this morning have had very rough weeks. And it's been a dark week. I know I'm looking at a name right now on here that, that has had a week like that. And what a comfort it is to pray knowing that he is your intimate father. And, you know, that's not just something that was foreign in Jesus' time. In our day as well, we know that when it comes to mother and father, the one who is considered less intimate is the father. And I, especially over the last couple of hundred years, it's, getting, it's gotten a little better in the last two generations, uh, the intimacy that, that fathers share with their children. But for a long, long time, it has been the father's kind of been the standoffish one. He's there. He's the provider, but he's not really the nurturer. Um, it has gotten a little bit better in our society and culture, um, at least as far as the ideal father goes, the ideal picture of a father goes. But if you watch TV shows and movies, this is still the way that fathers are, are portrayed. They're not the loving and the caring ones. That's still mom. In fact, in some theological circles, there is this idea that's been introduced in the last 10 or 15 years about uh, the mother heart of God. And I've heard this term thrown around a little bit. And, and so people will speak about the mother heart of God because God is so caring. Well, truth is, uh, this is um, not just an incorrect statement. This is almost a blasphemous statement. Uh, it's one that, that cuts uh, uh, the, the notion of father right in half. And people will speak of this mother heart of God because, well, God, he's not distant like a father. He has this nurturing thing. That, that's, that's a horrible term, the mother heart of God. The thing is, is that God, he, uh, he just models the ideal father heart. You know, he doesn't uh, show us a mother heart. He just shows us what the proper heart of a father should be. He, because he is the ideal father. He doesn't need a mother heart. And God is never referred to as a mother in scripture. He's always referred to as father. He's a, he's a masculine figure. Not only is he, is he uh, um, a boss over all things, but he's the carer of all things as well. So he doesn't need a mother heart. And we see that in scripture. It, he has opened himself up to us. In fact, he's always been open to us. He taught all through the Old Testament. He's always saying, come back to me. In the Psalms that we're going through on Wednesday nights, tonight we'll go through the Psalms again. And uh, we always see that, that he, he hides us in the shadow of his wings and he takes care, care of us. So he's opened himself up to us in an intimate sense. Uh, we're, and he's done that through the blood of Jesus. You know, we were closed off from the Father. Because we're sinners, and so that severed a, a personal relationship uh, with him. But when Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he tore that temple veil in two, that was God opening himself up to you and me. And we're no longer closed off because God always makes himself accessible. So pray. When you pray, know that you can pray to your Father on an intimate level. Because he's a father who cares, who shows compassion. He's a father who is tender and he nurtures us as well. And that's one thing that we see wrapped up in this term, father. That the teachers of Jesus' day would have said, no, 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 that's, that's too close. Well, God is close now. And Jesus corrects the teachers and he shows us how to pray this way. Now, there's another thing that we need to know that's wrapped up in this term father as well, though. So we can pray to him knowing him as intimate, but we also need to pray knowing that he is the authoritative father. And you see, father carries a sense of authority as well. And I know that in our current cultural context, authority is being stripped from fathers. Um, but 
The fact of the matter is, is that's the way that God has created fathers. The uh, role of father is, is the one in the family with whom the buck stops. The role of the father is that he is really the final authoritative figure in a family. And yeah, I know, maybe that sounds sexist to say, but that's the way it is in the Bible. That's the way God has created things. I know in our household, it may be a rough day at home for mom, but boy, wait till your father gets home and bam, the authority can be dished out pretty quickly. Um, it's the way that God's made male voices. People, Kids respond more to the authority of a male voice than than a female voice because father carries a sense of authority. And so when we come to God in this intimate prayer sense, we also need to come to him with a realization of the authority of the father. To know that when we say that word father, that means that he's not just, hey, hey pops, you know, kind of thing. It's, the, there, there's, a, uh, there's a sense of power in there, knowing that he wields power. There's a sense of knowing that he has the final say in things. And so when we come to God in prayer, we enjoy the intimacy, but we also come with reverence as well, knowing that, that he is father over everything. I mean, he is the father. He has sovereignty in this world. He has sovereignty over you, over you and over me and over everything else. And so we approach our father with reverence. We also, when we pray, we approach him knowing that father knows best, to use the term of the, the, the old saying. This father, the earthly fathers don't always know best, but our father in heaven, he absolutely knows best. And so when we come to him in prayer and we pray for things, we have to come with a realization that that he knows a lot better than we do about what we need and what needs to be done in this life and this world and with those that we're praying for. And so we come to him saying, Father, your will be done and submitting to God's will, even if it supersedes our own, because he knows best. So know that when you pray, you are praying to an authoritative father as well who rules over your life and my life, but also rules over everything. And so we come to him with respect and reverence, knowing that his will is best. But at the same time, we come to him with that sense of loving kindness and care that, that a truly intimate father has. Guys, what a privilege it is to be able to come to God and open our prayers uh, to him as Father, not just Holy Heavenly Lord, although he is that, or um, God who's everywhere, he is that but he is your father. And this is why Jesus cried out to him, Abba, Father, my father. And you and I can do the same because Jesus has opened up the way. So wow, only one word. And you know what? We have just skimmed the surface of what that word father means. But I hope that, uh, that what we've talked about this morning just helps you. I know it's helped, helped me helps you as you pray to God, your Father, to know what a privilege it is and know that He loves you and cares about you and that at the same time, He is He's all-powerful. And the buck stops with Him. Well, guys, that really kind of wraps up what we have to say about that this morning, for this morning. Uh, we could probably go on, but we don't want to go over time. Um, if, you, uh, if you have any other thoughts, feel free to share them. In the, uh, in the comment section. Um, before we close in prayer, uh, I just want to remind you guys of the prayer meeting that we have tonight. Um, that's going to be at 7 o'clock Pacific time, so join us. I'll be posting something on Facebook, and if you're part of the church, I'll be sending out a church-wide email about that, so please join us. Uh, what an opportunity it is to pray. Remember, we, we, we don't really have any um, anything in us that, that that gives us the right to pray, but God gives us the privilege to pray. pray. So join us tonight. I um, want to remind you about Friday, the road sign ministry. If you haven't been out there and tried that, come out and try it just for even a half hour. But that's Friday between 4 and 5.30 p.m. You don't have to be there for the whole thing. We've got lots of signs. 
come join us and, and be the light of Christ to those who pass by. Hundreds, if not thousands of cars pass by there on Friday afternoon. If you have something else that you want to share with the group, go ahead and post it in the comments. Maybe you know of something else that's going on that would be a blessing to others or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe a blessing to somebody that you're trying to witness to, but let us know. Well, let's close in prayer. Our mm -hmm. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us today our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For truly, you are, Lord, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. Have a great day. And uh, if we don't see you before Sunday, or maybe I don't won't see you on Sunday, in the case of Carolyn Bouquet, all the way from Ontario, maybe we'll see you here next week. All right. Go and serve him. Bye for now.